The following program is brought to you by Caltech. Good evening. Um, I'm Jonathan Katz, Chair of the Division of the Humanities and Social Sciences at Caltech, and it's uh, my great pleasure to welcome you this evening's Watson Lecture. Uh, but those of you who are regulars here will know that my first job actually is not to introduce tonight's lecture, but to tell you about the next one. So let me do that. Uh, the next Watson Lecture is going to be on November 2nd, and it's by Dr. Kenneth Klassen from the Jet Propulsion Laboratory speaking on catching comets up close cheaply. His uh, explanation part. I'm sure that'll be a, an excellent lecture. Um, but it's my great pleasure this evening to introduce my colleague, Antonio Rangel, and his lecture entitled, Neuroeconomics, How Does Your Brain Make Decisions? Caltech's at the forefront of research at the intersection of neuroscience and social science. What this group is interested in understanding is, does understanding how the, the wiring of the brain um, impact our understanding about how individuals and make individual decision making and group decision making. And Caltech's uniquely positioned uh, to make an impact in this field because unlike most universities, there's no boundaries between departments. Uh, so in my group in the, in the social sciences, I have card carrying uh, political scientists and economists who work at the intersection of neuroscience and I have card carrying neuroscientists. Um, in fact, we've created the first of its kind uh, graduate research program in decision and social neurosciences that's seeding this new field. And Antonio really sits at the intersection as a, a center point of this effort. In fact, he's the only Caltech faculty member who has, who has the title both of professor of neuroscience and of economics. Um, Antonio is a homegrown product. Uh, he's a Caltech alum. He got his uh, Bachelor of Science degree in economics um, in 1993. Then he went off to Harvard and got his master's and PhD in economics. Uh, he then went off and was uh, on faculty for a while at Stanford and, uh, and a member of the National Bureau of Economic Research. And then he did a very daring thing for a young scholar. Um, before tenure, he decided to change the field he was working in and move full tilt into the world of neuroscience. Um, this is not a bet that most people would have made, uh, those of us who are, know academics or are academics. Uh, it's a bet, it was a calculated bet, one that's really paid off both for him and for the Institute. And so I, I think you're gonna see some of that tonight. Um, the one thing I do have to tell you about Antonio is he's incredibly enthusiastic about many things, uh, most of all Caltech and his research. And so I think you're gonna get a real treat tonight. Um, and it's with my pleasure I introduce Antonio Rangel. Antonio, thank you. Hi, good evening. Um, I normally say that if the Spanglish makes something unclear, you should ask for a clarification question, but with an audience this size, you are stuck with the Spanglish, I'm sorry. Um, humans have struggled for a very long time, I would say since the beginning of human history, in trying to understand human nature. And we care about these questions because we care about understanding who we are and because it, they influence almost everything we do as human beings, uh, workers, voters, et cetera. And for example, any parent of a young child, of which I'm one of them, very quickly realizes how little we know about human nature when it comes time to decide what is the best way to steer this new life into the world. It's a very humbling experience. Um, a couple of familiar examples very quickly will illustrate how many fundamental questions about human nature we still don't understand? And why getting the answers to some of those questions is so absolutely critical. So in that figure is the young man called Sean Tyler, who has become a minor celebrity in the web. He has become a minor celebrity because in January of 2009, he weighed 344 pounds and wore a 4XL shirt size. But 15 months later, as depicted on the right, he had lost 150 pounds and 
lost five shirt sizes. This Herculean effort has been followed by millions in a website called 34 pound, 344 pounds, sorry. And to me, it motivates some very, very sick questions about human nature. Why are there, for example, millions who are unable on a systematic basis to control their dietary intake, but are perfectly able to maintain absolutely tight self-control in other areas of their life? What's special about food or self-control? Why is it the case, even more sadly, statistically, this young man will gain the 150 pounds, even though he worked like hell to lose them? Is there something that we can do to help him? And millions like him. Let me give you another example that to me is very striking. Consider the domain of altruism and moral behavior. On one extreme, our species has produced people like Mother Teresa. And I think it's fair to say that her altruism and self-sacrifice towards others can only be described as saintly. I don't have another word to say that. On the other extreme, we have produced individuals like Bernie Madoff, who was able for decades to steal billions of dollars from his close childhood friends and the temple at which he prayed. What is different about the brains of these two individuals that generate such different behavior? <laughs> if you can get me Barney Beto on the scanner, I buy you lunch at the app, by the way, as a side note. That would be guaranteed science paper. <laughs> now, is there something that we can learn about human nature that will help my children be more like Mother Teresa than Bernie Madoff? Now, at the beginning of human, for many years, I would say, from the beginning of history, the exploration of human nature was done mostly in religion and philosophy. If you had a question about human nature, you went to your priest or you read Aristotle, I guess. Over the last century, the study of human nature has really become a scientific endeavor, especially in social science areas like economics and psychology. And although amazing and enormous progress has been done in these areas, I would argue that fundamental questions like the ones I posed to you still remain to be answered. And I have this slide here for you to illustrate how in some sense, how much there is still to learn and a very problematic state of affairs. So not only there are many things that remain to be understood, but when you look across the disciplines, there are even fundamental theories of human nature across different fields. So take the case of addiction. <coughs> At one extreme, many economists think of addiction as a perfectly rational decision. You snort early on because it feels good, even though you know that down the line things are not going to be pretty. But according to this very popular rational addiction model, it's a perfectly fine thing to do. And based on this view, economists, for example, tend to advocate a, fair, a fairly strong lace fair approach to the addiction public policy, perhaps only advocating the introduction of information so people make more informed decisions. At the other extreme, there are many clinical psychologists who view addiction as an extreme state in which basically you have no control over your decisions. You are some sort of automatic zombie driven to the substance. And based on this view, they advocate very strong public policy interventions. Clearly, at least one of these views is wrong. <laughs> okay. Now, A new view of how to make progress in the study of human nature has begun to rise over the last few years. And this view is actually based on a remarkably simple idea, which is that everything you are, everything you feel, everything you think is generated by the workings of your brain. You are your brain. Sorry. <laughs> and therefore, if you bite that bullet, which, by the way, I'm sure some of you want, and it will come out of the Q&A, probably. But if you buy that bullet, it turns out then that if we can understand how the brain works in these different situations, we should be able to improve and refine our understanding of human nature. This view 
of this agenda, sometimes it's called the neurocomputational view, and the reason or approach to studying human nature. And the reason is called that because any scholar working on this field basically wants to answer three questions for any problem related to human nature. First, what are the computations that the brain makes in different settings to solve the problem that the human being needs to solve? Second, how does the brain implement these computations? And third, how does these computations, these processes, give rise from the brain up to the behavior, the perceptions, the thoughts that we experience? By the way, please, I'm going to use this word computation a lot. Don't be confused by it. It's literally writing mathematical models to try to understand the variables that the brain is playing with to be able to solve different kinds of problems. The vision of this approach can be illustrated in this diagram. At the top, you have behavior, which has been the domain, maybe with a little bit of models of what drives this behavior of the social sciences, economic and psychology. At the bottom, you have neurobiology, the brain. How does the brain work? What does it do? That at that level has been basically the exclusive purview of neuroscience and neurobiology. The goal here is to bridge both worlds through the understanding of computation. What are the variables that the brain has to keep track? How does it modify it to solve different kinds of problems? And the view, the dream here is that a full understanding of human nature really requires you understanding the three levels as described by the three questions that I gave you. Another very powerful idea about this is that if you have a pet theory about human nature, it better be the case that whatever you think that you're doing when you are in a situation, let's say like making a decision, things that I'm gonna explain in a second, those computations are actually the way the brain is doing things. That is very powerful for this endeavor of understanding human nature because then you can test the models, not only to see if they are consistent with behavior, which is kind of what the best social science to date has done, but also making sure that that's actually what the brain is doing. And if any of you have spent time at some point in your life studying social sciences, that's a very powerful thing. Because there are many, many, many theories of human nature that are impossible to distinguish based on behavioral data alone. Now, <laughs> this neurocomputational approach is being used to study many different aspects of human nature, from morality to perception to decision making. Today, I'm going to talk about the work that we do in a field called neuroeconomics, which is basically studying the neural computational basis of human decision making. Okay. Now, in order to show you some of what we do and really give you a feeling of how it is done, in best Caltech style, I don't just want to give you the facts. I want to tell you why we know the facts, or why do we believe those are facts, so you can judge by yourself if we have proven our case or not, or where we are in the stage of proving our case. I need to give you a tiny bit of background of three key neuroscience ideas. Think of this as the world's shortest introduction to neuroscience, okay? <laughs> now, in this image, I am depicting a drawing of a typical neuron in the human brain. And this is the basic computational unit in the brain. And you should think of it as a biological computer or a computing device that basically takes input information that is coming from other neurons, does some transformations, and then it produces outputs by sending bursts of information once in a while by changing it, the, the rate at which it communicates with other neurons, okay? And then, and by the way, sorry, very important, the brain is basically made of 100 billion of these things, okay? But one beautiful thing is that these things exhibit remarkable specialization that we are only beginning to understand. So for example, there are neurons in an area of the brain called MT, who play a very, very specific computational purpose. When you're looking at the world, if your eyes detect motion in a specific direction, and only then that neuron fires, otherwise stays quiet. So you can think of those neurons as a motion detector for that kind of motion. 
Now, with 100 billion neurons, you can imagine there is a lot of possibilities for other degrees of specialization. Now, you can think of a typical human brain as an extremely interconnected network of such specialized computational units, each carrying out its own computations, talking to each other, and those computations unfolding over time. To get a feeling, and I think it's worthwhile doing that, of the complexity of the problem at hand, a typical human brain, as I just mentioned, has 100 billion neurons, approx, and a typical neuron connects between 2,000 and 10,000 other neurons. So this is a complex system. Now, fortunately, or I wouldn't be talking here to you, the way this brain, these neurons are located in the brain and the way they talk to each other is not completely random, either across problems or across individuals, or we could make no progress. There are some patterns of organization that we can exploit and we can discover, and that's why we can make progress in this area. So for example, for many years we have known that there are particular neurons and systems in the brain dedicated to a specialized control of particular motor functions, like moving my arm like this. And as you will see, one of the things that we are discovering in neuroeconomics is that there are particular systems involved in carrying out specific functions to help you make decisions. And I'm gonna tell you a lot more about that. <coughs> if you want to understand the logic really understand the logic of how to connect the social science computational study of human nature with the neurobiology, this is a key point of the talk for you. So I'm gonna illustrate how we connect both worlds and why the neural data is so valuable with a very simple example. Suppose I bring you to my lab and I set up some sort of experiment that at the end of the day allows me to measure, this is time over the experiment, that at particular points in time, you press a left button. Sometimes you do nothing, sometimes you press a right button. So I know exactly the behavior that you exhibit. And suppose that I want to understand what are the computational process that gives rise to that. Suppose that I have a theory, it doesn't matter for now where it comes from, that says that, well, there must be a part of your brain that is computing something that basically just before you're gonna make a left movement ramps up, and then during the movement it stabilizes, then go back to zero. And when you're gonna go to write, it does exactly the opposite, okay? Suppose that there is, that's your computational model. And again, you're gonna see where these things come from. Just take it at the abstract for now. Now, how could you test that with neural data? Well, the useful thing is that if that is your theory of how the brain is doing that, there better be systems in the brain that when you measure in real time the brain activity of the individual when it's performing this task, are encoding exactly this information, are ramping up here, staying, going down, et cetera. So we can ask, are there areas of the brain that are computing that? Or is a special area of a priori interest doing that? Things like that. And if it is the case that there is nothing in the brain, no matter how hard we look, that does that, that's probably not a very good theory of how that behavior was generated. I hope you see the link between the two worlds. We're gonna use this logic time and time again over the rest of the talk. Now, of course, to do that link, we need to be able to measure neural activity in real time in humans. There are many, we're very lucky that now there are many techniques that we can use to measure neural activity, and all of them play an important role in my field in neuroeconomics, but they have relative advantage and disadvantages. So let me give you a feeling for a couple of techniques that are very prominent. One is called single unit neurophysiology. You can basically stick a very, very skinny electrode under the skull, find a neuron in an area of interest, and record the activity basically in continuous time of that individual neuron. Now, that is great because you really have a lot of data about a single neuron, very precise data, but it's bad because you probably don't want to do it in humans, and because you can only measure one neuron at a time, and therefore you don't get a picture of everything that is going in the brain at once and how areas are connected to each other to generate behaviors. On the other extreme, there is a technique that has really revolutionized the agenda, the research agenda that I work on, which is functional magnetic resonance imaging. This is a picture of a 3T scanner located in our imaging center a few hundred feet from here. This is basically, if you have ever been in a scanner in a hospital, it looks very similar. 
is a machine that generates a very strong static field, in this particular case, three Tesla, an individual lies here, we can, we then move them into the machine. They normally wear a set of goggles and they have some sort of handheld video game-like control device. And therefore we can ask them, as you will see, to do different tasks, behavioral tasks in response to instruction on the screen. Think of it like playing useful video games while we monitor their brain activity. Now, the advantage of this technique is that we can measure brain activity of almost anyone, except for some health considerations. Um, it has decent spatial resolution. We can basically measure levels of aggregate activity or something that correlates with that, to be precise, in voxels of the order of one to three millimeters per site in volume. And we can measure activity in the entire brain every two seconds. So it's, has some advantages, whole brain coverage, doing humans and over neurophysiology, some disadvantages. Just want to give you a feeling for this. Okay. The background is over. Let's go to the fun stuff. Okay. So in my lab, we study the neurocomputational basis of various forms of decision making. And for the rest, of the lecture, I'm gonna show you what we have learned about some of them. I'm gonna start with simple choice. And simple choice is literally apples of oranges. The simple, most exciting kinds of decisions that we do every day. I put an apple in front of you, I put an orange in front of you, you want the apple, you reach with your left hand, you want the orange, you reach with your right hand. That's it. Now, we study them because understanding them is essential to provide a scientific foundation for the rest of the field. And because as you will see, even this very simple kind of choice already generates some very interesting insights. After I finish this, I will tell you about work that we do in more complex forms of choice, like self-control. And if it comes out in the QA, about choice involving altruistic considerations. <clears throat> so let's think about simple choice. Here is a very simple, very stylized, non-technical description of a computational model of simple choice. The idea is you have these two things in front of you. How might your brain solve this problem? So hypothesis, after it recognizes that item and that is the one that requires the left action, it assigns a value to it. Let's call it value left. It takes the orange, assigns a value right. Somehow those two values are passed through a comparison process that decides something about the relative attractiveness and picks one of them. And eventually, when one of the two options is selected, a motor action, let's say reach left or reach right, is deployed. It's an intuitive model. Need not be right, because we haven't checked yet whether that's actually the way the brain does it. But in order to test it, you can ask three very basic questions. If this is true, question number one, there better be the case that there are systems in the brain which are specialized and dedicated to assigning value to a stimuli at the time of choice. If that, you cannot find those systems, the brain is somehow solving this in a different way. Question number two, if the first one is true, how are these values actually computed? Where do they come from? How does the brain solve that? And question number three, how are they compared? So let me tell you a little bit about these three questions. Very, very basic questions on the science of neuroeconomics. How would you go about studying the first question? How does the brain compute values? Here's a very, simple experiment that we carried a few years ago to do this. So we take undergraduates, they're always undergraduates, they fast for four hours, and then they come to the scanner and they're gonna solve a task that I will describe in a second that requires them purchasing food for real. They care about what they buy and about their decisions because they know they have to sit on the lab for 30 minutes and they're hungry. These are undergraduates, they're hungry. We know we can also measure that. And basically, at the end of the experiment, we implement one of the decisions, and what they get to it depends on the choices that they made, on the quality of their choices. Now, how does that what are the kinds of things that they are making choices over? I'm sad to tell you the basic Celtic undergraduate diet, the breakfast of champions, <laughs> things like this, okay? Now, these people are lying in the scanner, and they are seeing in their, in their goggles pictures like this, for example. We show them a picture of this particular food, and we tell them, while you're looking at the picture, please ask yourself how much are you willing to pay for this at the end of the for the right to eat this at the end of the experiment, and press a button, which they get to press when they are prompted for a bid and the trial lens. And we do that for hundreds of items, okay? Now, this is very useful because look what happens. 
here the subject's brain is thinking about what's, it's, it's computing the value of this thing. And we also have a behavioral measure, trial by trial, subject by subject, of how much they value this thing. Then we can ask, we can ask a basic question. Are there areas of the brain that while the subject is evaluating the item, correlate or seem to encode the value of the stimulus that we just measure during their bid? Okay? And the answer is yes. There are, in particular, two areas of the brain that reliably the level of activity there during the time of decision encode the value, the measured value that the brain is assigning to the stimulus. Now, these graphs are not intuitive, so I'm going to take a couple of minutes to explore them, to explain them. And by the way, regardless of what you may infer from the popular press, and unfortunately for me, the scanner actually doesn't take pictures like this. Okay, this is actually just a useful way of summarizing a lot of data. So, in particular, in this image, there are two sets of data that we are depicting for you. One is the background information, which looks like a fuzzy picture of the brain. That's called a structural scan. So as part of the experiment, every subject gets a very detailed scan of the anatomy of their brain. What we have done here is afterwards put everybody's brain kind of in the same scale, what is called normalization, and then average them across subjects. And that gives you an idea of where the average brain of the subject is. We can depict points in the brain by cutting three planes. This plane is a cut like this. That plane is a cut like this. And that plane is a horizontal plane like this. Okay? That's the front of the brain, that's the back of the brain, etc. I'm also gonna use the magic finger to map the anatomy to my head, so don't worry about locating yourself in the brain. Now, the other piece of data that I'm plotting here is. Remember, with the scanner, we can measure activity, measures of neural activity every two seconds while you are in the scanner, everywhere in the brain. In these little boxes, in this particular case, three millimeters by three millimeters by three millimeters. And about 100,000 of them in this experiment. And then we can ask, for each one of them, is the response, the change in measure activity in this particular voxel, encoding or correlating with the measure of the behavior of the value that you assign to each one of the foods. And what we have done here is plot in color for you areas of the brain that satisfy that property. That we are very, very sure after a lot of careful statistical testing that they satisfy this property. So what's the answer? There is this area that is called the medial orbitofrontal frontal cortex. This is basically different views of the same area, which is, if you look at my finger, pointer, locator, about an inch behind the bridge of your eyes at the base of your frontal brain. And there is another area called the right dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, more accurately a subset of it, that will be approximately where my finger is on the right, that also has that property. Nothing else did. There has been a lot of follow-up work on this study by our group and others to really understand more the properties of the activity in these areas to really make sure is really encoding values that drive choices. So, it has been found, for example, that using neurophysiology monkeys, that the same is true, and in rats now. And there have been experiments using other kinds of decisions, like giving money to charity, or deciding whether or not to take gambles, like a win of this and a loss of this, or deciding whether or not to pay a fixed price for exciting items like Caltech paraphernalia or Kit Kats or money. <laughs> in all cases, this area of the brain encoded in color here, different colors, they're not different experiments, always, always seems to encode the value that the brain assigns to the stimuli at the time of choice. There are, I would say, now about 50 experiments that show this. And two of the important properties of this signal is important to emphasize. We know now that that is not a consequence of choice, but a precursor of choice. That signal is there regardless of what you choose. Okay? And that's very important if you think that that is a driver of choices, not something that happens afterwards. Another thing that is interesting about this signal and this area, the property and the location of that signal depends on the stimulus and something like your hunger, your physiological state, etc., but not on other details of the choice situation. So it doesn't matter which action you need to take. It doesn't matter whether you're bidding with money or making a binary choice. 
constant activity encoding that. As you would expect, if the model that I outlined for you at the beginning had a component of truth. So bottom line, so far, there is a strong and growing evidence that there is a set of neurons in this general area of the medial orbitofrontal cortex that respond at the time of decisions as is encoding a value signal for each option that can be used to guide choices. Cool. Now, let's consider the second question. Okay, now we know the signal is there. How is this signal computed? In particular, how does the brain know which value to assign to each particular option? Okay. So here is a computational, very, very simplified computational idea of how we think the brain makes that. So consider assigning, again, a value to something like an apple in order to decide whether or not you want to eat it. So we think that what the brain does is it takes a stimulus and it computes the value of different properties of attributes that it has. In this particular case, for example, maybe how sweet was the water content, calorie content, acidity, et cetera. Let me emphasize that we don't know what exactly the attributes are. And it's very likely that they are not in a space that is intuitive for humans. That's an open question. But we think that it decomposes into attributes. Then the brain assigns a, val oops, a value to each attribute. So what's the value right now for me of having something that is that sweet or that acid, et cetera? And then assigns a total value by summing up all of those things. It's very basic attributed decomposition and then integration. Okay? Now, that way of doing things is actually very attractive for one reason. Some psychologists had hypothesized in the past that basically the way you assign value to things is by memory. If you had this type of water in the past and it was good, you learn to assign a high value to it to like it. If you didn't, you didn't like it, you assign a low value to it at the time of choice. Well, that's intuitive and it may be a very good thing to do, but it has a problem. If you only learn to assign value like that, what do you do when I show you a cranberry juice that just came out in the market that you have never shown before? You wouldn't know how to solve that problem. If you're able to do this, as long as you can extract the characteristics of things, you can solve the problem of assigning value. Now, this also can be tested. And for the sake of time, I'm going to describe just the intuition of this. And we have carried out tests. In many different ways, here's one particular experiment. We bring subjects to the lab, yes, undergraduates, and we ask them to make decisions about how much they like this very fashionable line of T-shirts that we just created for them in the lab. We literally create those T-shirts. And these T-shirts have two properties. They vary in two properties. One of them is visual, visual attractiveness. Those symbols come in all sorts of sizes and colors and shapes and fonts, et cetera. And believe it or not, to my surprise, the undergraduates actually care and are willing to pay different amounts for different symbols. The other one is semantic content or conceptual content. Those, even though are Korean words, we teach some Korean to the students, and they come in very different flavors. Some of them says peace. Other ones mean your mother is a dog, literally. Okay? And again, undergraduates have a different preferences for them. So you can think, and we can verify that behaviorally, the value that they assign at this teacher with making decisions depend on how much of the two attributes they have and how they value them. Now, once you know that, you can ask two questions. First, is it the case that the same area of the brain, this medial orbital frontal cortex, it still correlates with the value, the total value of these t-shirts at the time of decision? Yes. Always, so far. But the more interesting question is, we also measure how much they value the different attributes, both of the meanings and of the fonts, et cetera. And then we can ask, are there areas of the brain that encode the value that they assign to the semantic component, but not to the visual component and vice versa? And the answer is yes. For example, this area of the brain called the posterior superior temporal gyrus correlates at the time of decision with the value of the semantic information, but not the visual. This area of the brain, this is at the back of the brain, around here, it's called the fusiform gyrus, has the opposite property. Now, to us, that was very interesting because from a lot of other previous neuroscience, we know that this area plays a heavy role in interpreting the semantic meaning of things, even when there are no decisions involved, and that this area of the brain plays a big role of 
doing computation about visual properties of a stimuli. So what do we learn from this? It's as if, as the model suggests, when you see these t-shirts, somehow these different aspects of the decision are decomposed, evaluated in specialized areas. And by the way, we also can do analysis to ask, are the values that get computed here being passed there as if being added up? And the answer is yes. I'm not going to show you that. It's too technical, but the answer is yes, too. So everything kicks in consistent with the theory that I have shown you so far. So in other words, these value signals that we think are driving your choices that get computed right behind your eyebrows don't just appear there. A lot of other areas of the cortex that are specialized in particular computations about the properties of the things that you're deciding about have to come into play and kind of inform the decision of how to eventually come up with a value. And I'll tell you in a second why that is interesting. Let's consider the third question um, briefly about how values get compared. Now, a very natural but extremely naive view would be to say, ah, thankfully, the comparison problem is trivial. You go to the OFC, you see what value was assigned to the left item, what value was assigned to the right item, and then you just pick the best one, right? If you have studied economics, that's certainly what you would guess. Well, that view is very intuitive, but it's missing two very important things. The first thing is that for your brain, there is a lot of uncertainty. You put a stimulus in front of it, and the process of measuring the value, of extracting the value of that thing, has noise, has randomness. And that randomness needs to be taken into account in an optimal way that doesn't, as I will show you in a second, just look like pick the best thing. More interestingly, I'm sure that all of you are familiar with the following. Please look at the speaker. You arrive at a convenience store. There is the display of items, and you do this. Look carefully. Right? You look, compare, and then you choose. If you do this, you are a freak. Okay? <laughs> now, why is it that attention seems to play such a critical role in the comparison process? In this simple idea that I just told you, or just pick the maximum thing, there was no need to do this. It's still this. So why? What's going on? With a grad student that just graduated from the lab, a few years ago, we came up with a idea based on a lot of very beautiful mathematical psychology from the past that the brain was doing this using something called an attentional drift diffusion model. It's a fancy name for actually some very intuitive ideas. This is represented graphically, and let me explain what the idea is. So suppose that I present you with a decision here. Choose left or choose right. And then time until you make a decision runs along this line, runs to the right. The idea is that in real time, your brain computes what we call a relative value signal, which is the current best estimate for the brain of how much better left is than right. And that signal evolves over time. The model also assumes that there are two barriers, two kind of bounds. If the signal, this relative value signal, gets high enough, left gets chosen, with the idea that left gets chosen because the current estimate at that point of left being better than right is high enough and vice versa if it gets low enough. Now, two key things about how this thing evolved, two key hypotheses. The first one is that that thing is random, okay? The second thing is that it, for example, look here, even though it's random, it's not completely random, it evolves with a slope, with a slope that depends on the true underlying value of the two things that you're looking at. So if you're looking at left, and left is better than right, it will tend to climb towards left, at this, this slope of climbing gets higher and higher, the better left is relative to right. And here comes the final kicker. The model assumes that the way you move your eyes in that convenience store example that I just gave you is completely random and exogenous to the problem because it's controlled by different... <laughs> um, and completely um, 
exogenous to the decision-making systems. But that attention matters in the following way. So suppose that randomness determines that during this time you look left, during this time you look right, and during this time you look left. Then the idea is that you're always climbing towards the barrier, you're always biased in climbing towards the barrier you're looking at. So for example, when you're looking left, you don't climb with a value proportional to value of left minus value of right, but you cannot discount the value of the thing that you're not looking at as if you could not compute it just right. So for example, in this, ex in this case, when you're looking left, let's say that the value of left was five, the value of right was three, you climb with a value not of, of a little bit more than two. But when you flip, you don't keep climbing at the same rate, you actually flip. And if the items are close enough, you start climbing in the other way. I know this last part was a little bit technical, but it's not critical to, for what follows. Now, this model has a lot of interesting properties. As you will see in a second, it predicts that choice is random. There's some inherent randomness in the choice because the noise could be that you could always with positive probability and anywhere. It also predicts that attention matters. If I somehow can control where you fixate your eyes, I can get you to choose more in one direction than the other. Let me show you more about that. Okay. So we have done, over the last few years, a lot of testing in this model, both behavior and neural. I'm just going to give you a taste for it, for a couple of things that I find particularly interesting. So the first thing we did was to carry out a simple eye tracking experiment. Subjects were shown pairs of items. They were free to look at them, and when they were ready to make a choice, they pressed a button that we, we told them, we gave them feedback what it was, and did that hundreds of times, and then we gave them to it whatever they chose in a random trial. The critical thing is that we independently measured the value of each item, so we knew what the latent and the underlying values were, and where people were fixating. Now, once you know those things, you can run the model, literally quantitative, to ask questions like, what should be the pattern of correlation, of co-occurrence, between the pattern of fixations and the choice probabilities and how long it takes to make decisions and things like that? And let me just give you a couple of examples. The, 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 the predictions are really counterintuitive in many cases. So this is a graph that does the following. It asks, look at a trial, a choice episode, and ask, at the end of the choice episode, how much longer did you look at left than right? So if you're here, you look the same at both. Here you look more at left. Here you look more at right. And then you can ask, what's the probability that you choose left? Contro controlling for everything else. The model in red are the predictions of the model, okay? estimated out of sample, not with the data. In black is the actual data. So if for some reason, for example, randomness led you to look more at right than left, you had about, uh, let's say by a difference of about one second, which is not that much for normal decision making, you were on average 40% more likely to choose left. Come on, 40% guys. <laughs> if Nabisco could manipulate choice by 40%, <laughs> their stock will be very happy. Now, let me give you another example. Going back to my physical illustration, but it's important. Notice that there is nothing in the universe that prevents you from doing this. Please look carefully. I look left, I look right, I look left, I choose right. There is nothing that says you have to look last at the thing that you choose. Nothing. And in fact, subjects do it sometimes. But when you run the model, the model predicts that the last fixation has an enormous impact on what you choose. In particular, if you compare, for example, you, you construct a measure of how much better was the underlying value of left minus right, given by some liking ratings, it suggests that the probability of choosing left should be like this when the last fixation was right, or like this when the last fixation was left. Again, about a 40 percentage point gap. And what is remarkable is not only that the model predicts that, but the accurate quantitative predictions of the theory. It matched the data incredibly well. So to us, this is strong evidence that the neural circuitry is implementing something like this. Let me just give you another quick idea of another test that we did of this model, this time using neural data. Now, this is another representation of the same idea that I just gave you before of this attention adrift diffusion model, but I want to link it to the neurobiology in the following way. We think, based on a lot of work from perception, 
that basically the area of the orbitofrontal cortex that we have, I've already shown you seems to encode values. When you have to make these binary choices, encodes a relative value, basically encoding, let's say, how much better is left than right. That that signal is passed to an area that implements the comparison process, encodes basically that relative variable, keeps track of it, and then something compares whether, or keeps track of whether a barrier has been crossed, and then triggers the choice. Now, if this attentional drift diffusion model is true, one critical thing is that the values that get computed, these relative values that get computed in the evaluation areas, have to be modulated by attention. And if you are with me, you will see it immediately, not just take my word for it, just for now. When you look at left, the value needs to look something like value of left minus value of right. But when you switch your fixation and you look at right, the code needs to switch. In particular, any, if the neural process of the comparator and of the simple choice is done the way I'm telling you, it has to be the case that there is a value signal in these areas involved in valuation like the OFC that is always encoded. What's the value of the thing I'm looking at minus the thing that I'm not, the value of the thing that I'm not attending? Okay? That is critical for that model to be true. Is this true? So we basically run a version of their tracking experiment in the scanner in which we control where subjects look and ask, in these areas of the middle orbit of frontal cortex that we have been talking about, is there a relative value signal modulated by attention that seems to encode the value of the thing that I'm looking at minus the value of the other thing? Voila. Just as the theory predicts. So this gives us even more confidence that, among other extra tests, that the brain is really implementing something like this attentional drip diffusion model that we, that I have been telling you about. So I know I got technical, it's gonna relax for a second. Um, some of the details are complicated, but the ideas are simple and powerful. So what I want you to get from this part about simple choice are just two key ideas. One is that simple choices involve two different processes. One is that a value needs to be assigned to each stimulus to guide choices, and that those values are computed by calculating the attributes or the properties of a stimulus and adding them up. And the second, that the brain is making the choices using the values, not just by choosing the best value or the highest value, but through this more complicated, more so, a subtle model in which both uncertainty and stochasticity and attention play a role. Now, To me, this is of basic scientific interest because we really want to understand how the brain makes decisions. But even if you are less into that and you want to come back just to the study of human nature, even at this preliminary early years of the science, knowing these two things already gave you some insights about interesting things. So let me remark about some of them. So first, if the brain is, as the data suggests, making choices through this attention drift diffusion model, it has to be the case that mistakes are unavoidable. In fact, when we look across the body of data of our laboratory for simple choices, it looks like about 20% of choices are mistakes. Okay? Now, why are there mistakes? It mistakes because there is a stochasticity. Even if you were always looking left and you were always climbing on average like this, there is randomness, so you may end up here. And we can measure the amount of noise and it's such that such types of choice, such types of mistakes are possible. I have good news for you, though. When I tell you there are 20% mistakes, most of the mistakes tend to happen where the value of the two options are close by. If the two things are sufficiently different, and I see many of you nodding, the noise will clean out and there won't be a mistake. Okay, so if you want to avoid mistakes, go to stores that never show you things that are close by in value. <laughs> A joke. Okay. Now, here's another fundamental insight that many of you probably know intuitively, but this gives you exactly why, the deep reason for why it's the case. There is a trade-off between accuracy or the quality of decision making and the time you take with your decision. In particular, if you slow down your decision making process, you are less likely to make mistakes. Here is why. It's very intuitive if you understand the logic of this model. 
Suppose that you do an experiment in which you take the two barriers, the criteria that you set for when you trigger a choice, and you move them apart. Okay? Then you will be you will compute in these values, and you will only trigger a choice when one of the relative values is very, very large compared to the other. But intuitively, that means that a lot of the noise must have cleaned out. Okay? So by separating the barriers, which is equivalent to say, I really want to be very sure of what I do intuitively, you slow down the decision-making process, but you also decrease the probability of mistakes. The other thing I was telling you is that the theory strongly predicts that if I control your fixations, I can manipulate your choices. And we have actually tested this. We take the model, we make predictions about the type of manipulations that we need to make to attention. And give it or not, when we control exogenous your fixations, we move your choices in just the way that you predict. In particular, the more I get you to look at something that is appetitive, that has positive value, the more likely you are to choose it. This begins to give you an insight for why things like packaging, location in a shelf in a supermarket, et cetera, may matter so much. I know that retailers know this, but I also know that they don't know that this is why that is the case. <laughs> Now, this is a speculative, but this is, I just want to convey some of the excitement of this area. Psychologists have worried, worried correctly so for many years about differences in personality. I think that over time, this type of work from many, many labs across the world will provide what I call computational foundations and neural foundations for difference in personality. So for example, suppose that there are differences in your neural system between you and your less successful sibling <laughs> that make your less successful sibling much more impulsive than you are. This may be traced for how much noise there is in this integration process or where those barriers are. Now, this may sound very abstract, but some of the ongoing work that is going on allow us to track where those barriers are or the amount of noise to difference in brain features like properties of some neurotransmitter systems that can be traced to particular genes, et cetera. So those subtle differences can have very deep biological roots. And this may be my favorite. If you have studied economics, you may have heard this very famous term, degustibus non est disputandum, which basically says that economists believe that we are never going to argue when studying human nature about preferences. We just accept them as differences, we want to argue about something else, okay? Basically, people, economy says preferences are given. There is nothing interesting to say about this. The theory that I have shown you so far says that that may be true for some things, but it's not universally true. Why? If this view that values are computed by abstracting attributes and then integrating them to compute an overall stimulus values, the ability of particular cognitive systems to process different attributes may affect the value that you assign to them. Let me be concrete. Two examples, one that I have the data for. We are studying what are differences among people's willingness to help others, to behave altruistically. It turns out that there is an enormous association or correlation between people's ability or the extent to which areas of their brain related to social cognition, compute and keep track of the well-being of others, and the extent to which you actually behave altruistic towards them. Not only that, there are techniques, something called transmagnetic cranial stimulation, that allow us to modulate the ability of these areas to carry this function. And if you temporarily tune down those areas, that the only, they have nothing to do with preferences, that you have to do with the ability to keep track of others, you make people less altruistic. If you change the brain's ability to keep track of something, it may not value it, not because they don't care or they don't like it, but because they just don't process it. Okay? Okay. Let me now tell you a little bit about more complex choice or self-control. This part is gonna be built very quickly what we have seen so far and go significantly faster. So of course not every choice is apple or oranges, in particular, many choices require what we call the deployment of self-control. 
By the way, people in my lab, I'm very offended by this, constantly call this the Antonio problem. I don't like it. <laughs> um, so that observation gives rise to some basic questions. How exactly is this different from apples and oranges? Really, what changes? Why is it the case that we seem to have a very hard time making correct choices in this case, but not on the other? What is different about the brains of people who get this right and those who don't, et cetera? So we have spent quite a bit of time also in the lab working on this. And I wanted just to give you a taste for some of the things that we have found by using this type of dietary choice paradigm. So the, the idea is very simple. Again, people fast, they come to the lab, they make choices, and they only get to eat what they chose in a randomly selected trial, and they care because they are hungry and they have to stay there in the lab. Now, in this particular case, we enrich the diet of the subjects. It's not only the breakfast of champions, there are also healthy things, okay? <laughs> and in particular, we chose a set of items that for most people vary in two dimensions. How tasty do they think the items are? and how healthy they think they are. And for most people, those two dimensions are uncorrelated. They're independent of each other in the sample of foods. <laughs> okay? For the ones that we chose. It's, it's hard work. Don't think that it happens if you go to the supermarket and choose an hour, just at random. But before they enter the scanner, we ask them to provide us health ratings of every item and taste ratings of every item. And therefore, if you think about it, we cannot know how valuable they think these things are with respect to taste and with respect to health. Then we bring them to the scanner and we ask them to decide whether we show them one thing at a time, whether or not they want to choose each one of those items. So notice again, in the paradigm, I just want to highlight this. We measure these attributes, like value or health of the choices, and they're the choices that get made. Now, using this paradigm, we can define precisely what good dietary self-control means. Intuitively, a good, a good self-controller in this world is somebody basically, when they make choices, they give at least some weight to health. Let's not say they care only about health, but they are driven partly by health considerations. Now, this is how most people in the experiment behave. We divided our foods into four categories, split about whether they were liked, i.e. tasty or not, and whether they were healthy or unhealthy. So we can put them in four bins. And then we split, we can split people in two groups, what we call SC or good self-controllers and NSC or non-self-controllers. And basically what you find is that for things that are taste and healthy, like a power bar or things like that for most subjects, they all tend to say yes. Things that are disliked and unhealthy, spam, it's the prototype thing for my generation, Almost everybody says no. Now, the huge difference comes for things that are liked or tasty but unhealthy, Kit Kat bar. The self-controllers are able to say no, the non-self-controllers cannot. The Brussels sprouts problem, we haven't been able to crack, <laughs> okay? In, in repeated data sets, okay? So notice for, for the intuition, a couple of slides, if you want to understand what's different about these people, you need to realize why is it that pe these people basically are able to take into account that something is unhealthy, i.e. that the, val the value of the health component of the problem is low, but the other ones are not doing that. So how do you think about what the, how the brain may be computed its way through this problem? It's actually a very simple extension of the case of simple choice. The idea is as before, I show you something, you abstract attributes, you integrate the value of your attribute, and then you add them up to come up with a final value. And everything is supposed to be the same in the theory, but there is one key twist. And is that now there are, we think that there are two, based on a lot of work on psychology, behavioral work, there are two kinds of attributes. These blue attributes that the brain computes very easily, almost automatically, and these other kinds of attributes that tend to be more abstract, more delayed, that the brain doesn't, is not as good as taking into account them, taking them into account, okay? It says if there is a bias towards valuing these things properly and undervaluing are the weighting those things. So how do we test this model? 
We can test by running the experiment I just described in the scanner with dieters. And what we find is, first finding is, same areas of the brain as before, like this middle orbital frontal cortex, encodes the value that people assign at the time of choice to the foods, regardless of whether they are good or bad dieters, with one key twist, which is the people who are good dieters, which are in blue, when you ask to what extent is their response in this area of the brain responsive to taste or health, it responds to both. But when you look at the bad self-controllers, it only responds to taste. So somehow the good self-controllers have managed to incorporate these more abstract characteristics when computing the value. Second key difference, when you ask, is there any area of the brain that comes active in good self-controllers but not in bad self-controllers? There is only one area of the brain that comes up, and it's an area in the left dorsolateral prefrontal cortex around here. And you can see here that not only is more active in good self-controllers than in bad self-controllers, but even within groups, you can ask, is there a difference in activity within the group when they were successful in self-control in that trial versus not? And the answer is yes. Here comes the more interesting part. You can ask, are, how are these two parts connected, this DLPFC area and the basic valuation area? And to make the story short, doing a lot of hard work, you can show that this left dorsolateral prefrontal area comes online in good self-controllers, modulates down this other area on inferior, in an area called inferior frontal gyros, which modulates down activity in the OFC. That negative modulation ends up tuning down the value assigned to these tasty unhealthy items in good self-controllers, but not at all in bad self-controllers. That is the key difference between the two groups. And here comes the kicker. Once you realize that there is this fundamental difference in which these two groups are making the choice, you can ask, okay, they naturally have that difference, but can we help others? And in particular, could it be the case that if I get you to pay attention to the health property of food, you are more likely to take into account that information, make better choices, and does this happen by activating exactly the same neural network? Because I'm running late, the answer is yes and yes. <laughs> okay, it's exactly the same neural network, you can help. And that's very interesting because basically tells you that there are there may be two routes to activating these necessary computations in this area of DLPFC to be able to evaluate these more abstract characteristics. Now, I'm almost done. What do I want you to take from this part about more complex self-control choices? The most important thing is that the difference between at least this type of complex self-control choices and the simple choice is a very seemingly trivial one, which is that there are some attributes that we tend to underweight in some problems that tend to be more abstract and more long-term. Good self-controllers can weigh them properly, bad self-controllers cannot. And that there is this area of the brain in the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex that only when it comes online and sends the right information to the area of orbitofrontal cortex involving basic valuation, good things happen in choice. Now, why is that exciting beyond the basic science? Just some very quick remarks. This area of DLPFC that is differentially activated in good and bad self-controllers happens to be an area of the brain that has been heavily involved in a cognitive activities like working memory, like numerical thinking, abstract thinking, and things like that. And in particular, people with more IQ tend to activate them more strongly during those areas. And in particular, people with more IQ are also known to be less impulsive. That may be part of where the connection comes from. Another interesting comment that comes from this. Many of you probably have teenage kids or have had teenage kids, and you have noticed an interesting pattern of impulsivity during certain years that then <laughs> goes down. Well, it turns out that the areas of lateral prefrontal cortex that are differentially activated in self-control are some of the areas of the brain that mature the latest in some people into their early 20s. May there be a connection? This is being explored by several groups. They have been known for a long time by psychologists that if I put you under conditions of stress or cognitive load, you have to remember something while you are making a choice, you are less likely to make a healthy or self-controlled choice. 
Well, it just happens to be the case that if I do the same thing, I stress you out, the areas of the brain, the, the, the part of the RPFC that is required to these activities also activates less. Another connection. And very speculative, it may be again the case that a lot of personality differences can be traced back to difference in the ability to activate these cognitive areas. Now, if this is true and it's extremely speculative, it's things that we're playing with, you may be able to make predictions of the following form. It may be the case that people who are worse of controllers are also less altruistic. Why? Because in both cases, making good choices require computing these attributes that are not as automatic. In one case about delayed things, in another case about others. Speculative. Okay, now let me just very briefly come back to the big picture. I'm almost done, it's two minutes. I hope that these studies that I have shown you have given you a taste for the ongoing effort to integrate the social, behavioral, and biological sciences. And to me, the vision, this neurocomputational vision that I have described to you is incredibly exciting. It is incredibly exciting controlling for the fact that I'm a Spaniard and I'm naturally excitable. It's very <laughs> exciting. I feel extremely lucky to live in a scientific age where these questions can be asked for the first time and at some point during my lifetime or the next one will be cracked up. And the most exciting thing is that you won't have debates with your priest about the nature of human nature when this is solved. You will open science and check out the facts to resolve these debates. To someone like me, this is beautiful. I also think that beyond advancing our understanding of, social nat of, of human nature, these things are gonna generate a lot of incredible, interesting applications. I don't have time, so let me just mention a couple of things that I don't know what T is, but in T years, we will see. It may be that in a few years, we take teenagers as they are developing, put them in a scanner tasks that are not very different from this, to see how the key structures of the brain are developing. Why? Not because we want to typecast them, but because we want to know who will benefit from additional and extremely costly behavioral help. Okay. There are several people already working based on findings like this on what we call real-time decision-making mistake detectors. My favorite example is imagine a soldier in Fallujah. It's a 19-year-old who may never have been outside the United States, carrying a deadly weapon and surrounded by people yelling a language he doesn't understand. Wouldn't you like to be where the commander of that young man to know if he's about to snap so you can protect him and others? These real-time measurement technologies are gonna become online. Now, together with excitement, I also want to emphasize two points. The first one is that this is slow, difficult, laborious, and my students and postdocs will vouch for this, backbreaking work that will take a long time to get right. These insights come at a trickle. Now, so we have to wait to really fully realize the vision. Like in any revolution, this one comes with its shares of nonsense and its snake oil peddlers. And I just want to show you, not my favorite, but the most recent example. In New York Times, about 10 days ago, decided to put on the op ed page something, an editorial by this man, Martin Lindstrom, who is called You Love Your iPhone, literally. This man is a marketing consultant who, as far as we can tell, has never taken a biology class in his, class in his life, <laughs> who decided to put people in a scanner, show them an iPhone, and then based on the brain data, somehow look through the clouds and decide that you love your iPhone, okay? Please, when you read the press, laugh at things like this, it's nonsense, <laughs> okay? I feel extremely lucky to be a professor at Caltech for three reasons. One is what I'll call the Caltech Neuroeconomics Gang. These are four of my colleagues from left to right, Ralph Adolf, John O'Doherty, Colin Cameron, Peter Bossert. 
these are incredible scholars who have helped and shape this vision and advance this vision, and I learned a tremendous amount from them every day. This work would not happen without the collaboration that we have with each other. To my lab, for the same reason, and I want to remind you there is only one Caltech, and I believe this from the bottom of my heart. Science is wacky, only takes place at places like this. Thank you.